Hi. In this video, we'll continue our discussion about chromosomes, talking about their structure and the three essential parts of a chromosome. We'll talk about chromatin, which is the DNA chromosomes and the bound protein. We'll talk about histone proteins, which are the primary proteins which package DNA inside the cell. And we'll talk specifically about the tails of the histone proteins, the very ends of it, which play an important role in the regulation of gene expression. In this video and the next several, we'll be talking primarily about the events that are happening during interphase. That is the part of the cell cycle that is not directly involved with mitosis, which we'll be speaking about at a later time. During the cell cycle, the chromosomes exist in different configurations. During interphase, which is most of the time in which the cell is actually doing work, the chromosomes are uncondensed. They're spread out as far as they can go. It's during mitosis when the chromosomes will compact incredibly and will form the structures you can see here. There are three essential components to any chromosome, the telomere, replications of origin, and the centromere. We've already met the centromere when we saw the pictures of karyotypes and the way that the chromosomes were aligned. The centromeres are the center part of the chromosome, and it'll be to these features which the mitotic spindle will attach and will help pull and separate the two chromosomes from each other during cell division. The telomere is the ends of the chromosome. They have a specific, st specific structure that helps protect the linear ends of the chromosome from de degradation. Additionally, they play an important role in regulating the lifespan of normal cells. The third important part is the replication of origin. Each chromosome has many replications of or origin. It's essential here that at least there is one replication of origin on either side of the centromere, because replication will not cross a centromere. As the name suggests, this is the place where DNA begins replicating itself. We'll discuss, discuss each of these pieces in further slides. On this slide, you can see a detailed image of an interphase nucleus where the chromosomes are at their most unwound. Even in this state you, state, you can see that there is some structure in the way that the chromosomes are organized in the nucleus. Different colors indicate patches where a particular chromosome dominates that space. We don't yet understand the importance of the relationships of the locations of the different chromosomes and whether it's unchanging or varies from person to person or over time, whether it's a fundamental property on the organization of the chromosomes, but it does seem clear that the organization is regulated in some manner, so there must be a reason for it. At the bottom here, you can see an electron micrograph of a nucleus. The borders of the nucleus are right here. And where, within the nucleus, there's an area of dark color. This is the nucleolus. The, a nucleolus is an area of intense activity. It's where the ribosomal RNA and the RNA for ribosomal proteins are synthesized. Ribosomes are some of the most abundant proteins in a cell, and so they need to be ma made in great quantity throughout the cell's activity. On this slide, you can see various levels of organization that the un chromosome undergoes as it's packaged from its free form, which extends a few meters inside each cell, to its most fact compact form, which is about 10 microns in the longest dimension. This compaction ratio is approximately 100,000 fold. But the point is, it's already incredibly condensed in the cell, in a nucleus. And the way the cell achieves this compaction is quite remarkable. We'll focus mostly on the top levels of work organization. And in particular, we'll be talking about this one, the so-called bead on a string level. In this view, you can see that the red DNA is wrapped around the yellow proteins. Those yellow proteins are the histone proteins that we were talking about. And this picture is reasonably to scale. Approximately 150 base pairs of DNA winds around the histone proteins about twice and is separated by about 80 base pairs from other histones. A nucleosome refers to one set of histone proteins where the DNA wraps around approximately 1.8 times. This represents one of the beads of the bead on the, st bead on the string structure that we saw in the previous slide. The protein core is made up of four different histone proteins colored in green, blue, red, and orange. 
And there's two copies of each protein, so there's actually eight protein subunits on the inside of a protein core. A fifth histone protein, H1, binds to the outside of the nucleosome, but it's not shown in this picture. Each of these eight protein subunits has a tail region which can wrap around and bind the DNA very tightly. Only one is pictured in this uh, slide. It wraps around the DNA and binds it tightly by possessing a lot of positive charges. A lot of amino acids, lysine and arginine, which are positively charged, and they interact very strongly with the negatively charged DNA. We will look in detail at this interaction on a later slide. Here we have another picture of the banding patterns on chromosomes. As we can see now, we can say that the light regions are the ones that appear white in the picture. They're referred to as euchromatin. Euchromatin is less compact. It's more accessible to proteins, and in this case to fluorescent dyes, which are added to the preparation. Because the chromosome is less tightly wound, the dye can get in there and it will bind to the DNA, intercalating so that it will be able to be concentrated there and it can fluoresce very brightly. The dark regions are called heterochromatin. These stretches of DNA are wound very tightly around the histone proteins. There are fewer genes there and the genes that are there are more often than not inactive or turned off. Switching between these two regions, the very condensed chromatin of heterochromatin and the more open form of euchromatin, can be achieved by modifying the positive charges that are on the histone tails so that they will bind DNA less tightly and the DNA will be less tightly wound around the histones. To switch between these two forms of chromatin, highly condensed or more open, one has to remodel the chromatin. This is achieved by the input of energy, the hydrolysis of ATP. And rather than removing histones, they are slid along the DNA to have a greater spacing between each other. This is a configuration that the chromatin is likely to be in when it contains an active region with genes that are being transcribed. I think it's pretty remarkable that pol polymerases read DNA and transcribe it into RNA, the histones are present, they're not released. They're just held a bit even looser and the polymerase will navigate around the DNA. After the polymerase passes, the histones will once again bind more tightly. Now in this slide, we see a schematic of a histone protein in yellow. It's drawn extremely not to scale. Here's the carboxy terminus and here's the amino terminus. This is a blow-up of the histone tail region. As you can see, there are many lysine residues, six lysines. That's indicated by the letter K, which is the one-letter code for the amino acid. Now, lysines are positively charged, normally. When you have many unmodified lysines, you have all these positive charges interacting with negatively charged DNA. And as we've said many times already, opposite charges attract, so it's a strong interaction. This makes it difficult for the polymerase and other transcription factors to access the DNA. When the lysines are acetylated, that neutralizes the positive charge into a neutral state. Now, a neutral histone tail will interact less strongly with a negatively charged DNA. And in this case, the genes in this region of the chromosome are turned on. There are many intricate details about the modifications of the various residues in different locations of the histone tail. This is referred to as the histone code, which is still being elucidated. But for our purposes, we'll stick to the very basic point that if histones are acetylated, and in particular the lysine residues are acetylated, that the genes are turned on. Whereas if they are in their native state, the naked state without acetylation, there will be a great deal of positive charge and the genes are turned off. Now in this slide, we see a picture of the structure of lysine with the positively charged amino group at the end of the side chain connected to the alpha carbon. In the deacetylated state, you have a positively charged amino group and a negatively charged phosphate group of the DNA. If the lysine is acetylated, here's the amino group, here's the acetyl group, this neutralizes the positive charge. Now there's a negative charge on the DNA, but no positive charge on the protein, and the interaction is much weaker. 
On this slide, we see a schematic of a Drosophila chromosome. We see the centromere, we see the two telomeres, one on each end, and we see regions of heterochromatin alternating with euchromatin. Euchromatin, remember this is the light band in the chromosomal carrier types, and the, the heterochromatin represents the dark regions. This is where the active genes are. If genes are in this region, they are inactive. These regions are maintained and regulated by chromosome elements referred to as barriers, which can keep heterochromatin structure from spreading into the euchromatin region. In some cases, you have DNA anomalies where the chromosome is inverted. And now, there is no barrier between this gene and the heterochromatin. And as this picture, picture suggests, there are phenotypic consequences that result from merely altering the location of the gene. And in, for the fruit fly, this manifests itself in the pigment of the eye color. And while it's slightly confusing that if the white, that if the white gene is silenced, that white would appear on the eye, but nevertheless, that's the case. There are many, many other instances like this in almost any gene located near a centromere or a telomere. It's almost always le less active than genes that are some distance from either of these two structures. On this final slide, we once again summarize the main points of this lecture, the three essential parts of a chromosome, the nature of chromatin, the cr critical role of histone proteins, and the tails for regulating gene expression. Thanks for listening.